Hey everybody, welcome to a very special episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here, along with the old Vikings access boys, Chip Scoggins of the Star Tribune, Judd Zulgad as well. They used to be the grandest duo on the Vikings beat. They used to have terrible tweets when Twitter was just starting from Vikings training camp. You know them so well. And I wanted to put together this episode of some Vikings draft stories going back with you guys from when you were on the beat to the present because we're all waiting for Quasi to make this trade. So while we wait, this is what we're going to talk about. So I, I want to begin by going back as far as you guys uh, started on the beat and the first drafts you covered, which for you, Zolgad, was 06 and for Chip mm -hmm. was 2008. And I think, uh, Judd, a great place to begin this conversation was the Adrian Peterson draft pick and what you remember about that selection because I remember going into that draft and of course I was like, I don't know, in college maybe. Uh, but I remember thinking what well, Adrian Peterson should be the number one pick. Cause this was back in the day, Judd, this was yes. Sean Alexander is the best player in the NFL. Not these quarterbacks is a running league. So uh, what, what do you remember about that, that decision uh, to take Adrian Peterson and how he kind of fell ish into the Vikings lap? I remember being very surprised as the slide began so like, and, and it got to what, seven. So it wasn't this, you know, Mossonian slide into the twenties, but I remember the draft started and Peterson was again, a huge name. And at the time the running back position was still for lack of a better term respected. And so the draft starts and it's one of those where, Whoa, that that's still interesting. And then uh, where I realized it might come to fruition though, was I want to say it was Washington. Washington might have been picking right before the Vikings, and they didn't take him. And I think they needed, if I'm not mistaken at that time, they needed a running back. And they passed. And it was one of those where you're like, okay, somebody's got to stop this fall. And it makes sense. It's the Vikings. Only they had Chester Taylor, who they had signed in 2006, and, and he had come from being the backup in Baltimore to Jamal Lewis, had been a bell cow and was really good in 06. But yeah, it was Washington took at six, they took Laron Landry, who I think the Vikings liked. I think we had been told that the Vikings liked him. And so they took him and it's like, okay, are you going to pass up with, but with, by the way, an offensive coach, yeah. are you going to pass up? a running back who is seen as a generational talent. And, and I don't think this was the beginning of being afraid of running backs, Matthew. I seem to recall this was more of an injury history problem and he was coming off like a collarbone a shoulder. or a shoulder. Yeah. Shoulder. Yeah. Cause he, he eventually showed up to camp and had like a small protective thing for it. But anyway, the Vikings took him and to be, it made perfect sense. And Chester Taylor, the, the funniest thing about the whole, uh, Chester Taylor story was so he had been the bell cow in 06 he had a really nice season could catch he could block uh could definitely run but I remember in the clean out the locker room day at Winter Park he was like spent <laughs> Chester Taylor walked out and and I and we talked to him and he's like oh man I gotta I gotta go take some time off and blah 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 and I always thought you know what he probably doesn't hate this He's still going to make a ton. He's still going to play some, especially since it turned out that AP was not really a three down back. Um, but I just remember Chester Taylor, I think he wanted that top role, but then he really got it. And he was like, oh, this is a lot. So I'm never sure. I wasn't sure that he was as upset as fans thought. But yeah, it, it was too obvious. Somebody had to break that fall. And that's where the Vikings did it. And Spielman and Childress more so took Peterson. So Chip, was 07 your first season on the beat? No, uh, 08. So I did uh, Gophers football 07. And then so the draft, probably the draft of 08 was my first, one of my first like official duties on the on the beat with Judd. Okay. So by the, yeah, by the time you got to the privilege of working with Judd, Zolgad, <laughs> it was already, it was already clear. But since you were, you were in town already covering yeah. football, I mean, how fast was it? Do you remember that? everyone knew 
the greatness of Adrian Peterson, because as, as you mentioned, Judd, it wasn't immediate that he was a three down back. If he ever was really a three down back and, and there might've been still some critiques of his game in my memory. I only remember fantasy football and being like, okay, wow, they've got this superstar. Was it a longer process to you? No, I mean, it was already well established before I got on the beat. I, I, you know, I didn't cover him in training camp, but I covered Percy Harvin in training camp and I'm sure we'll get to him. When you have players like that, that are so much more gifted athletically that are off the charts, it shows up. I remember the first OTA, like we had with Percy, you're like, okay, this is different. You know, the way he runs, the way he gets out of breaks, everything about him is just different. You know, he can stay healthy. He's going to be great. And I got to imagine the writers that were there watching Adrian in those, in that first off season saw the first thing. And then, you know, obviously he has the monster game as a rookie where he sets the record and, and, He's just like this lightning combination of lightning bolt and power. And he didn't run out of bounds. He ran guys over and ran away from them. And so by the time I got on the beat that his second year, it was, you knew that this guy was special. When did you know Judd? Well, I think he was a training camp guy. He, he just had a presence about him. And I mean, he was such an athlete that it was, it was pretty clear. He, he was special. Now, the interesting thing though, is in Brad Childress's fashion, he would not make Peterson the lead back immediately. <laughs> so, so this was a, uh, oh God, how long was it? Cause we kept asking Brad and he got progressively more and more annoyed because Chester Taylor continued to start. So it's like, it's Chester's job. It's Chester. And, and I mean, they split carries. Don't get me wrong. He didn't ice out AP, but he also didn't make him the clear cut starter. And I, I say if there's one moment though that stood out really early, it was the um, it was like the first game where you saw Peterson and there was just such a dominant presence there. But uh, yeah, I think now I think if Kevin O'Connell got his hands on a guy like that, he might plug him in pretty quickly. Brad didn't want to, but there have been a, a few guys, as Chip said, Percy too, where there's just an athletic uptick that it's very, very clear. There's not going to be a lot of like struggling to fit in. Like you got to get stronger, son. Adrian Peterson didn't need to get stronger. Yeah. Like, you know, when you watch Justin Jefferson go through individual drills, there's like, there's one guy that stands out here that's above everyone else. It's just, it's just obvious. And you don't have to be some super scout to see when a guy sticks out because he's just so physically gifted in the things. It's so smooth. That's the thing I think you notice with, with, with Adrian, it was just the power and speed that you just had, you didn't see that really that combination with Percy. I just thought it was like everything about him, like that quick twitch smoothness in and out of breaks. It's like, man, he's just so fluid as an athlete. And so, um, yeah, it's kind of the football thing. It's like, you got to earn your way. You got to earn your playing time. We're not just going to give you to baloney. It's just a matter of time. Just give him the ball, you know? Well, well, that's what the, they have to do now anyway with rookie contracts is you want to get as much out of that guy yes. as you possibly can, especially even with running backs. Now, that wasn't that way back then. That was pre uh, the, the CBA that we have now. So then there was negotiations and the guy would get a big contract right away and that could go bust. And it was a totally different dynamic. That 07 draft, by the way, Adrian Peterson, Sidney Rice, and then in the fourth round, Brian Robinson. That was a really great uh, draft for them. And of course, Tyler Thigpen in the seventh <laughs> round, who they eventually uh, sadly lost to the uh, Kansas City Chiefs. Isn't there a story? Is there a Tyler They're Thigpen pissed. story? <laughs> yes. Childress, Childress ended the, the reason why Childress yes. brought a halt to the joint workouts with the Chiefs who were in River Falls at the time was because the Chiefs got a look at Thigpen, who Ch- who Childress wanted to get through to the practice squad and really liked. And and in retrospect, he wasn't totally wrong. But like for a seventh round pick, he had he had some talent, and he was livid that the Chiefs were like, "This kid's okay," <laughs> and plucked him off waivers. Yeah. And I remember that. I remember that. I think Chipper was an after practice yeah. session with Brad, and he was yeah. fuming that Tyler Thigpen. And, and of course, Rice is a great story because, you know, for the first couple of years, couldn't stay healthy. Yep. He had some talent, like not, it, it's not like, oh my God, he's great, but he had some talent. And then of course the Favre year, yeah. oh, he was, he, that. he was the guy. <laughs> 
He was the Javon Walker of the Vikings in 2009. He was the guy that Brett Favre chose to make a star. Yep. Uh, I love that Tyler Thigpen story. That's the classic coach getting uh, upset about something that doesn't matter really at all in that seventh round pick. Well, let's skip forward because the OA draft uh, chip, your first one was not all that uh, intense. No. I would say you had uh, uh, John David what? Booty was their second pick. Oh. And that was in the fifth round. <laughs> what did they have like four <laughs> picks that year, if I remember correctly? I think Tyler Johnson, uh, right? The, yes, the safety. Uh, they needed the long awaited yeah. safety, right? Yeah. No, it was uh, it was five five total picks. One of them was John Sullivan, though. Yeah, so like that, that turned good, out. He was a f- late rounder, like fourth or fifth round, right? Uh, so yeah. six, six. Yep. Oh my gosh, six yeah. rounds. Oh, oh wow, yeah, yeah. The, 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 Clearly, the Vikings um, back then did not have Rick Spielman's at least ten picks. No, because even in 08 or in in 09, I mean, they got one, two, three, four, five, and the first two were Percy Harvin and Phil Lodeholt. Yeah. So they were they were drafting their butts off back then, but. I want to talk about Percy Harvin. He's such an interesting one to me because uh, Adrian Peterson is non-controversial. They picked a great player who turned out to be great and only much later would become uh, controversial in town, but not as far as the draft went. With Percy Harvin, if you watched any Florida football ever in your life, you were like, sweet Moses, this is the best football man I've ever seen. And yet he ends up 22nd. So Chip, uh, what do you remember from that and sort of the controversial nature of Percy Harvin? Well, it was uh, that off season, Judd, I don't know if you remember this, but I'm sure you do. Rick Spielman had a pre-draft press conference, one of the you know regular things leading up, where he told us, unveiled the red dot. Remember, we're red dotting, guys. So he had yep. told us we, yep. we put, I went back and looked at the day, 78 red dots on draft-eligible players that we will not touch. Can't get the, he told you, you can't get the dot off, right? And this is from yep. either character issues or medical injury history. So these are these are they've gone through all the prospects and uh, put a red dot on the guys that under no circumstances will they touch. And then it comes out that Percy Harvin, I think, failed the, the drug test at the combine, the marijuana test. And so we were thinking, does he have a red dot? Does he not? We knew, you know, they need a wide receiver. And so back then we used to the press conference, let's say the draft was Thursday night, right? We'd have that press conference on Tuesday with with uh, Brad Childress. Well, it came out on Monday or, or that day that he had flown down to Florida privately, secretly, because he wanted to meet with Percy in person, on his own, meet his family, hang out with him for the day to get a better sense of uh, kind of his character and what you know what he was about. And as soon as we found that out, it was like, if Percy Harvin's there, whatever they're picking, they're taking him, right? Because Brad Childress is not going down there just on a whim. He's going down there as a, you know, dot in the eye, cross the T type of thing. And so um, sure enough, when he, you know, when he was there available, I think, uh, you know, the beat crew kind of felt like, okay, this is who they're going to take. And and they did. And, um, you know, it was, I don't know if it was controversial, uh, but it was it was the 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 symmetry between the we're red dotting everyone. We're not gonna you know we're not gonna take any chances on injuries or character flaws. And then they uh, you know they took Percy, who had a lot of publicity for uh, as a guy who failed the drug test at, at uh, that combine. So, but again, another guy who was too talented to bypass, and they felt comfortable taking him. Yeah, and and that was also a time, and we didn't find this out till I think shortly before Brad was was fired because he offered it up in a conference call with the Lions beat people that Brad had the final say on the fifty three, so he was the de facto GM. So in other words, that red dot just came off. <laughs> like I'm sure Rick's like, oh, you got to be careful, and Brad's yeah. like, bleep you. But the in, in, the interesting thing about that draft too, uh, Chip and Matthew, is this. So that is what that's pre far. Yes. But that, but that team was ready to cook. I mean, I think one reason why they went and got Brett was the quarterback play was not good, but they were literally adding for, for all of the, we're going to take the best player available for the long term. Cause I mean, Percy was a shooting star. Yeah. I mean, he crashed at some point there, but if you go back those first two picks, they solved tackle a yeah. wide receiver slot type of guy and a right tackle. Mm-hmm. 
And so like you were literally setting yourself up. And that's why I think the fire thing became so, so important. I remember, I think it was before that season at some point. In fact, it was before it was right before Favre came back in training camp that uh, the late great John Clayton came to camp. And you, he was basically like, this is a Super Bowl team. If they get a quarterback, this yeah. is a Super Bowl team. Like this team is phenomenal. This team is so talented. And like that was in large part, Percy played such a huge role. And and think about now, if you plugged a Percy Harvin in, into an offense at that age now, yeah. like he was great then, but that was like the unfounded freak years, right? You didn't know what to do with the now my god he'd be incredible because you'd know how to use him again. Jed, help me with the timing on this what was it was it because they always had the draft and they had that rookie camp and then they would bring in and they would start otas was it the rookie camp where he he got to atlanta and then turned back because of the migraines and didn't uh yeah he supposedly threw up in the in the airport and went and home was, i think he was taken no i think he was taken by ambulance to a hospital pumped with fluids and flown home was that the was and that, that, that was just camp? the start yeah that was that was like, that was the rookie camp yeah that was the immediate camp after that's the right and that's where you know the first thing was like you know because we we didn't know about the migraine history or anything like that but then when he came for the yeah that's what it was then he came for the full team so it wasn't just the rookies and draft picks and un, you know undrafted guys it was the full team and even there, he's out there with Sidney Rice, and uh, was Barry not? Barry was, um, was there, and and you know, established veterans. And Percy jumps out on the field. You're like, you know, this guy is going to be really good. Um, but it was always something. <laughs> Whether it's the migraines, do you or, guys yeah. think? Yeah. Do you guys think that in today's uh, medical world, mental health world, and also legal marijuana world that Percy Harvin and his problems would have been mitigated more or at least better understood because with some guys, it seems like to me, Percy Harvin had legitimate mental health issues, which is a common thing for people to have in society. And now we approach that as in let's try to help the guy work through it in every way that we can rather than, Oh, he's just a problem. And I feel like maybe it wouldn't all have been solvable with him because even we see Stefan Diggs yeah. uh, being traded <laughs> yeah. again. Yeah. So it's not, it's not always something you can fix, but I feel like with him that there may have been a much better chance for him to have consistently succeeded. Had we have better resources than we had that for sure. I mean, it's, it's more discussed. It's more uh, accepted. It's more out. No open. There's more, um, resources available to athletes. I don't think it would have been, I think there still would have been issues that would have come up with, with Percy, but I think just the understanding and probably grace that he would have been given for some of the, uh, battles that he had, I, I, there's no doubt it would have been, um, viewed and probably handled a little bit differently than what it was back then. Childress was not the right coach too. And, yeah. and Oh, Oh nine was largely Favre's team. And, you know, Favre could get along with everybody. And so Percy and Favre were like just huge buddies, at, at least for their age discrepancies. The one thing I question about your about what you just said, though, is this. Percy didn't end up coexisting uh, very well with Pete Carroll. Yeah. So like Pete Carroll, like, like I would have said if Percy had been drafted initially by the Seahawks and never played there, that, but, but, but hadn't played there, uh, like that was the weird thing. I think Percy... I think Percy's mental health issues probably went beyond like the ability of a football team to help, yeah. but that's what made t taking him in 09. So perfect. Like he fit, like that team should have gone to dare. I say they should have won the Super Bowl. The yeah. Season. And then if they do, do you even care that Percy yeah. doesn't last that long here? So like it was the perfect pick. And that's where, that's where I think the Vikings made a very smart move by saying, I don't care if he's got 18 red dots, yeah. we're ready to win. Yeah. And he makes us instantly better. And I don't, I don't think Sidney Rice Chipper is as good if Percy's no. not here because you had to pay attention to Percy. Sure, and it, I, Judd, you remember the the final training camp practice? We're down in Mankato, and this is all through the Favre's not coming, Favre's coming, Favre's, you know. Oh yeah. So they're having, and, and the quarterbacks are Tavares and Sage Rosenfels, and it is a the practice is just they can't complete a pass. I mean, the defense absolutely dominates it. Offense just is just not clicking. It's not working. And we're thinking, this is the last practice down there, Matthew. And we're thinking, Childress is going to come off here in his this field, and his head is absolutely going to explode. He's going to have a meltdown. He's going to be angry. And it was just like, 
He was just, you know, <laughs> like whistling while you work. It was like he couldn't have been in a better mood. And we're like, huh, it was weird. And then three days later, <laughs> helicopters above where we're parking. <laughs> here, comes Brett, here comes Brett Favre to save the day. We should have known by his yeah. mood that something was amiss. And don't don't forget, too, uh, to, to go back to 2008, while the Vikings didn't have a first-round pick, the reason why they didn't was the Jared Allen trade yeah. with Kansas City. So, like, I mean, that team had used the draft, and, you know, if, if I was to tell you that, that you could have taken Jared Allen in the first round of that draft, you'd be pretty pleased with that. Yeah. So, like, there was a, there was a fundamental, and, and this is where, you know what, we didn't give Brad enough credit. Brad Childress was not a great coach. He was a pretty damn good personnel guy, though. And so he had used the draft and or things surrounding the draft to make some pretty savvy moves to take a team that had been okay, not great, to being, you know, by 2009, a pretty big power. Percy Harvin was a big part of that, as you brought up that Peterson draft class. Steve Hutchinson. And trading, yeah, and trading your first pick in 08. And that was a costly trade. I mean, if you go back and look, um, the Vikings took a real chance <clears throat> with a guy again who might have had a red dot or six, and it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were able to build by the time Favre got there, such an incredible team. And you see the key pieces that came together through the draft. And uh, now it's time to fast forward a little bit here. And I, I just want to, this is like a trigger warning. Like uh -oh. they put on TV, like there may be images that are disturbing. <laughs> there may be commentary that is disturbing as we get to the 2011 NFL draft where Christian Ponder. We don't talk about first that. First round draft pick. <laughs> we don't talk you about may, that. <laughs> you may want to. Now, look, Christian Ponder's name on my show has been banned from fans bringing it up in the chat because everybody wants to compare every potential Vikings yeah. quarterback pick to Christian Ponder. So the big question that I want to know from you guys, because I hear about this constantly. I was not here yet. I was a few uh, years away from arriving. When the uh, Vikings picked Christian Ponder, though, I was just kind of breaking into media at that point, and I remembered thinking – Mike Mayock is probably right on draft night that they reached for Christian Ponder. But I also thought, well, geez, they got Adrian Peterson and they should be still a great team and so forth. So I, I thought, well, this, this should, could work. I, I think the only place to go with this is why it didn't work. Why Christian Ponder failed. Uh, desperation at that position led you to taking a player who in a spot that he shouldn't be taken at. And we dumped on Christian Ponder for so many years and it became so just, you know, you couldn't discuss him without criticizing him to, to where it got a point to, you know, for me, it reached a point. It's like, now, wait a second. He didn't draft himself. <laughs> Number 11. So let's, let's shift the focus to, to the person that made the decisions and not Ponder. But, you know, after, after the 2010 disaster and Favre was, you know, that was a nightmare and he was going, Everybody knew they were taking a quarterback. They had to. Leslie Frazier and everybody, they didn't basically try to hide it, much like Kevin O'Connell and the staff is doing right now. You know what they're going to do. Um, and they reached. They reached for a guy who, uh, you know, was not ready for that, that spot. They reached, and the problem was they were they, – they plopped him into an incredibly dysfunctional – situation as well so when Childers got fired and then Frazier got the job because he, he came in and you know coach well Chipper and I saw it they go to Philadelphia we're stuck there for three days they plan a <laughs> Tuesday and they beat a pretty good team and what they did was and this was the craziest thing what they did was they gave Frazier a defensive guy 50 percent of the personnel say and Spielman who was not GM yet if I am correct yeah 50 percent and I remember being at the owners' meetings. I want to say they were in Orlando that year in March and talking to Frazier. And, you know, Les is a pretty straightforward guy. He's not going to BS you too much. And he made it very clear, I, I want a veteran QB. Like, I, I want somebody who can step in and win. And it was very clear that Rick was like, well, I want to draft a QB. And so you literally had, if not warring factions, two very important factions that need to work together pulling apart. They both made their own choice, and they were both equally as crappy. So the veteran QB is Donovan McNabb, 
who Chip and I had covered, <laughs> I believe, in 2010 in a game for Washington, yes. Matthew, where seeing him play, we're both like, his arm is shot. He has no arm left. And, and that's a game that the Vikings won. And so that was Les's guy. And Ponder was Spielman's guy. And if you recall, McNabb was <laughs> out of shape, <laughs> going to all the, all the McDonald's and Arby's that he could. And he started the season, and it was a, I think it was a night game. It was a primetime game in Chicago at halftime. The Vikings are terrible. They look <clears> terrible. <throat> McNabb is absolutely skipping passes. The bounce passes. And, yeah. yeah, the bounce passes to Shanko. I mean, Shanko was like being thrown basketball bounce passes with a football. And they bring in Ponder at halftime. And if Christian Ponder ever did have a chance, I don't know if he did or not, but if he was ever going to be developed correctly, that was a play-by-play -play of how not to do it. And so from, a, from the very top, from the Wilfs who gave out dual control, which was idiotic, and eventually pretty quickly thereafter was taken away, they screwed the pooch there. They absolutely screwed the pooch. And Ponder was caught in the middle. And look, he might have been terrible regardless, but you literally had McNabb and Ponder, yeah. both guys hoping that they could save them, and both were absolutely not. And I think they're, you know, they're at least Rick's judgment or thought process was, I'm tired of having stop gaps at quarterback. I'm tired of having veterans coming in here only here for a year, two years, short time. Mm -hmm. Let's find that long overdue, long awaited franchise quarterback. And hey, we got Adrian Peterson. We'll be a run first and this will be his best friend and it'll, it'll remove some of the, you know, a lot of the pressure from him. He won't have to do much. Well, sounds good in theory or maybe in principle, but when it, you know, when you, when you try to win that way and the different factors, it just didn't work. And, you know, we all love Ponder as a person. He was a great guy to deal with. Took a lot of criticism with a lot of uh, grace and understanding. But I remember, you know, during the, the worst times there when it was clear that it was done, you just felt like, okay, they need to move on and, you know, let this guy just have some peace, you know, because it was just – everything was being dumped on his lap, you know? Well, and I know this feeling even just from watching some wide receiver cornerback and possibly safety picks fail who are first rounders. It's hard to watch a man drown because it starts off where you kind of know something's not right. Yeah. And then you go, well, maybe. And then we have that off season and okay, well uh, he could take the next step and then he doesn't. And then everyone knows it's over and the guy's still here. Yep. If it was a fourth rounder, he'd just be cut, but he's still there. And yep. it's just uncomfortable. I guess my only question about ponder is when I look through the history of successes and failures, oftentimes they're connected really well with supporting cast coaching fit with the organization was ponder just not good enough or was there a world where had it been a little different had there been different receivers had there been different coaching had it been not the McNabb and maybe he developed for a year or was it just never there so you're saying if you put him on this Vikings team now with Kevin O'Connell and Justin Jefferson how would he fare back then probably a little bit better but I just don't know that he had the arm talent Judd um I don't think O'Connell would ever take him. Yeah, so. it's it's I I don't see it, Matthew. Um, not saying he couldn't play a little bit better if the personnel and coaching and all that was elevated, but I, I sort of think I would tend to say no because quarterbacks still can rise above circumstances, mm -hmm. right? And I, he just he was unable to do that. And and it, you know it, this goes back to Peterson in that 2012 season and how great. He was that year to get that team to the to the playoffs. That was um, a special individual performance by a guy. One Always. of the craziest stats that I ever ran across was that running Adrian Peterson was more efficient than passing the ball that year, which you almost <laughs> never see. I mean, if if you if you adjust for sacks and interceptions, handing the ball off to the running back was literally a better play for the Vikings than it was to drop back to pass. And that's just, even by 2011, that's not something you run across very often. I agree with you guys. I don't think it was ever there. There was never that ability to rise above anything. And he also just didn't have a, a cockiness that you see, even if someone isn't the most talented, if they have a self-belief that is through the roof, sometimes they can overcome the shortcomings of their physical ability. 
it doesn't seem like he ever really had that. Joe, do you think they fell in love with the the intangibles in terms of his who he was as a person and and the way he projected himself and and I me mean, because he's a you know very articulate, bright, well thought out, uh, yeah. you know, high character guy, and you do wonder if they thought, well, if that kind of made them overlook to some degree or a lot a lot of degree the physical tools. I th- I think Rick didn't trade up and and if you recall that quarterback uh draft was, you know, a lot of a lot of first round guys that failed. Yes. And I think Rick I think Rick panicked. I think yeah. Rick just said I got to take one, I got to take yeah. one who's left, who's left, who's left and uh took ponder and if you guys recall and this was at the time it seemed harsh it turned out to be spot on. It was Trent Dilfer yeah. at ESPN at the time who came out and savaged the pick. He said, yeah. this is an awful pick, way too high. He doesn't have the talent. And at the time, I was like, my God, this is really harsh. But he he was right. But, I mean, I, I heard Rick, I think it was during training camp last year, he, he was on a, a serious satellite show talking about the uh, QBs and stuff. And he basically said, I'd still have a job if, if I could have found one. So, like, he yeah. fully acknowledges – I'm, I mean, his kryptonite was, unfortunately for him, probably the most important position in sports. And he's exactly right. Like, Rick, you know, the Bridgewater thing we can revisit, certainly, because that's also bad luck. But if you guys uh, uh, recall the story on that one, that was Norv Turner is the guy. Bridgewater had that terrible pro day, and Norv said, let me go to, down to Miami and work him out mm-hmm. myself. And he came back and said, I would draft. Yeah. That was not Rick. So, like, I don't know that Rick ever really found one. And that's where O'Connell should be a different ball game. I would hope he at least deserves the chance. Yeah. And sometimes it is just bad luck. Yes. Sometimes teams have reached on quarterbacks that nobody thinks is going to work out. And they end up working out and uh, it just never did with Ponder. But it's always fascinating to pick apart all the layers of how that yep. decision got made and why it didn't work. Now, the following season, they could have sucked for luck, but they didn't suck quite enough. Man, you know, oh, just uh, ever so close. Now, Matt Khalil is another case of a guy who uh, uh, did not end up working out. And he was great at the start yeah. and then came came apart as it went along. The injuries, I also think he didn't love football that much. Um, but that draft night must have been insane for you guys. There was the, the multi, you know, first round draft picks. You're picking at the very top of the draft. And the second guy in the 2012 draft, Harrison Smith, is still here and has made a Hall of Fame case. That's an interesting one. Yeah, the, the Matt Khalil one's still a conundrum to me, Judd and Matthew, because when I we watched him that rookie year, you're like, this guy's going to be their left tackle for 10 years. He's going to be a multiple Pro Bowl type guy. And it just went downhill. And some of that's injuries the back, right? Um, but it just – he was the guy you had such high expectations after his initial year, and it – it just, you know, for whatever reasons, and I think there's more than one, uh, that one didn't pan out. If you guys go back, though, so to go back to the suck for luck thing, okay? And luck's, I mean, I still think luck was a generational talent. I do too. Now, now, unfortunately, a certain GM who might have a job with the Vikings right now didn't get him the infrastructure of the offensive line that might have helped extend his career. But if you guys go back to that one, what pisses me off to this day is they had three wins, right? Three wins that season. And <laughs> two of them were unnecessary. You beat Arizona yeah. fair and square here at the Metrodome, but you should have been a one win team because if you look at it, they had a win. I, I want to say against the Panthers in which it might've been Graham Gano missed a field goal and the Vikings won. And then of course there's the famous Adrian Peterson shreds his knee game where poor Les Frazier says, goes hooray. to the podium post game. <laughs> yeah, hooray, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Christmas Eve, they beat Washington in a game that they only won because, if I'm not mistaken, Ponder got hurt. They put Joe Webb in. Yeah. The, Washington had no clue what to do. And if Ponder hadn't got hurt, they lose that game. So forget Matt Khalil. <laughs> forget the whole first round because you could have had – I mean, imagine oh that. Oh, my gosh. And, and imagine if you protect Luck. Matthew, yeah. like think about how this could have played out. And that was, that's a generational talent right there. I think, oh. I think that is, I think that was the, I think that was Leslie's after post game thing. Hooray. It like, was. Hooray. hooray. He's like, no, not hooray. Out of my seat. not hooray. You're missing on me. Andrew Love. And Peterson's knee and it, it, is it, on the field. 
Uh, okay, so there is a, 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 a thought, though, that. that even though they did not get Andrew Luck, and by the way, in the subsequent years, they did not put together good offensive lines. Yes. So that's worth pointing out as well. I watched yeah, a, a few quite bad offensive lines. Yeah, uh, I true. am certain, though, that uh, Andrew Luck would have taken this franchise to places that uh, it rarely ends up going yes. consistently had he been the quarterback. But there's also another take here that if Matt Khalil had been the version that he was in his first year. And I think this was just me showing up as he was leaving, but I got the impression that he was mentally soft because when he went to Carolina, he said something about how he wasn't coached correctly or whatever. It was like, Oh, okay. I see. I get it now. I get it. It's you're, you're failing and you don't know how to pull yourself out of it. That, that didn't he throw a, a snowball at a fan or something like stuff like that? Yeah. Tipped his hat off. His hat yeah. Off. Oh, flipped his hat the off. The fan was right. heckling him outside <laughs> yeah. the golfer stating me. Right. Tipped his hat off. <laughs> stuff like that you usually don't see from guys who are mentally tough. So, yeah. but if Khalil turns out to be great, and years later they end up drafting Teddy Bridgewater anyway. And they have him as that rock solid superstar rather than scrambling in 2016. Yeah. It's just a total disaster. 2017, yeah. they had to spend all that money on an average left tackle and Riley Reef and Mike Remmers. And it just did, you know, they never really truly built that good offensive line. There was a effect of him failing the way that he did that impacted them for many years. And it took until Christian Derrissaw until they could actually find their guy. Um, but I don't want to go just entirely year by year, but I do want a quick take on 2013 yeah. with three first round draft picks. I mean, you were there that, that night the, though, that right? Was, were you guys, you guys worn out the fingers that night? That was crazy. You were there that night though, right? The best part of that night is they have, you know, they take Sharif Floyd and Xavier Rhodes with the first two picks. And Spielman is down in the field house. This is when we're at the old winter park and he's down in the field house doing his press conference uh talking about the two picks and, and i see you can see he's starting to become distracted and i see tom west the longtime pr guy kind of giving him signals you know and and Spillman says uh we're gonna have to pause right here I'll, I'll be back and he runs upstairs right makes the pick for uh cordero patterson runs back down and he says where were we that was that was a great moment um but yeah three first round picks i mean it was uh uh as opposed to what was the year we had no first round picks it was the Dalvin cook year right and then uh yep. to get three that year was you know that was a busy night that was what, what's sad too is if if between injuries and if cordero had been used correctly that was a really good first round because Sharif Floyd is one of the, I think, saddest stories. Yes. Sharif Floyd is a really good player. Like, like he and and the doctor screwed him up. Like, there's no question that 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 was one of the few times that you could have issued a press press release that said Vikings defensive tackle Sharif Floyd underwent unsuccessful surgery, and we have no idea when he'll yeah. play again. You know, Zim unfortunately made made fun of it, but it wasn't funny at all. Yeah. That was a really good player. Xavier Rhodes turned out to be a 25, a fantastic yeah. pick. And Chip, they got that one in the Percy Harvey yes. deal, correct? Yes. From Seattle, which, by the way, was a good trade. Yeah. When Percy did get dealt, that was a nice trade. And then Cordero turned out to be a bust as a wide receiver. But if you had used him, again, he's a guy who was also, he couldn't really run a route, but he he was ahead of his time in skill set. Yeah. And the Vikings just didn't harness that. So, like, there's a case to be made from a personnel standpoint that that's a pretty good draft. Injury hurts you, and then Patterson, the coaching staff just – That's the thing it. with Patterson is, like, you take this guy who has unique skill set and try to pigeonhole him into a wide receiver role, whereas they just didn't – if you're taking him, you're thinking hybrid. We're going to use him in all these different creative ways. And, and they tried it at different times to, you know – Jet sweeps, wild, wild, but it's just, I don't think they ever really fully understood what they had in Cordero. I remember and, it It was the, uh, I think Collar and I were covering the team together at this point. Was it David Montgomery, who was the big, big receiver from Green Bay that McCarthy decided to put in the backfield? Yeah. And Matthew, we talked Ty about Montgomery. it. Yeah, Ty, Ty Montgomery. Montgomery. Yeah. Ty Montgomery. And we're like, this guy profiles a lot like Cordero. Yeah. Why not try that? 
and the Vikings never did it. And then, and I'm not saying Cordero turned out to be a perfect player, yeah. but there was definitely something there. And the Packers sort of gave you the blueprint, Matthew. And and the Vikings, you know, Zim in Zim fashion, I think, was pissed off by was that. Was that Musgrave? Didn't give was that, that Musgrave or Turner? That was the uh, OC then. Musgrave, right? Bill Musgrave? Well, Musgrave no, was... started out with him and used yeah. him in some of those kind of fun ways yeah. with toss and pitches yeah. and stuff. That's and he right. averaged like 12 yards of carry yeah. when they did it. And then uh, Turner, North, I think, was yeah. driven crazy by the fact that he couldn't master the offense. Yeah. And I remember times, even in 2016, where Shermer tried to use him more and he did use the bubble screens and stuff. But th- even then, not the jet sweeps. And when Adrian was out in 2016, they should have just put him in the backfield. I remember yeah. writing that article and getting throttled by Vikings fans. You can't put a receiver in the backfield. Like, I think you can. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, that's probably what you remember, Judd. We talked about this so much. And then yeah. he goes to New England and Zimmer had to admit, like, I, I screwed that up. Like we should have been finding ways to get him the football. They were throwing to like Charles Johnson instead of giving the ball <laughs> yeah. to Cordero Patterson. It didn't make a whole lot of sense. That should have been a great pick. And still, even despite the fact that he's disappointing because of the way he was used, the guy's the greatest kick returner, pure kick returner ever. And uh, he, that, that just shows you how good he was with the football. So that's, yeah, that's one of regrets where they actually did get great players. Uh, we don't have to go through every single year, but I, I want to know from you guys recently, and then we'll finish on what you think they'll do this year. Recently, what do you think the biggest regret that the Vikings have in their last couple of years drafting? And I know 2022 is a bad draft, but I don't know if I would say that that is the biggest regret that they necessarily I've, should have in their drafting. I got what one. Do you guys Hamilton? Think? What do you guys I, I don't know. I, I got, well, no, that, that is, but I'd like to take this one last <laughs> chance to pick on good old Rick Spielman, uh, the 2020 draft and you got Jefferson. Okay. Yeah. Now he fell to you as well. So congratulations. Great pick. Diggs trade actually has worked out really yeah. good for you, but unfortunately God rest his soul. It's the Jeff Gladney pick. I mean, yeah. we, so, so, so there are first, uh, it's rare, but there are first guesses. Okay. And I remember, well, I mean, hell, Chip watched this guy's whole career, but I think Collar and I watched him a lot too. We all said Antoine Winfield Jr. is special. Yeah. Like you can tell. And and in part because Collar saw the, the old man in Buffalo and, and we, Chip, covered the old man here. So if you're like, well, yeah, but he's really small. Okay, daddy was small <laughs> yeah. too. He's bigger and than he dad. Basically, yeah. And he's bigger than and, dad. And he was a hybrid linebacker cornerback. Yeah. Um, if you look at what they passed on to take Gladney, it's, and you know, again, the kid died. It's terrible. Yeah. But that pick was a first guess. I think we're all like, really? And so that's mine. I would still say the Hamilton, uh, from 2022 and, you know, you could have had him when you see him play for, for Baltimore and the lack of that's true. really any kind of presence at all so far from Lewis scene. It, it, you know, you know, that Georgia defense that Lewis, Lewis scene was on was great. So probably everybody looks great at that point. But so, and, and I'm sure the injury probably has had a, you know, an impact on too, but you, you can't even know now if he's part of your, what it, part of your foundation moving forward. I mean, that that's just a big whiff right now. The only reason that I would say Hamilton, even though it's it's bad that they didn't pick him, is not as impactful as some other worst busts, is because Josh Metellus became that guy pretty yeah. quickly. Yeah. And not, he, he's maybe not quite as good as Hamilton, but he was really excellent in that role last year in that hybrid that we thought didn't exist, where there are some other picks, and you mentioned the Gladney one. Judd, not only did they pass up an Antoine Winfield Jr., but also a certain Vikings reporter may have been banging the drum for Jalen Hurts to be picked and developed behind Kirk Cousins to be their future yeah. quarterback. I'm just saying <laughs> that well, Lamar Jackson, I mean, yeah, Jackson, Lamar Jackson, you, you were banging on that drum harder, I think. Uh, Jackson, I was, yeah, because I thought I mean, you were all Kirk over si- the Lamar Jackson one. Kirk signed such a short term deal, and Jackson was looked at as a developmental player. Now, he obviously got good faster than I expected, but it was the same idea with both guys, where it's like 
the the Packers sit here and draft quarterbacks and develop them and they work. And obviously that happened with Mahomes as well. Why not try to do that? Uh, and instead, no, we need this. And that's why we've gotten to mine, which is 2019 with Garrett Bradbury and Irv Smith Jr. Now we were sold on Garrett Bradbury as the ultimate Gary Kubiak center. The next Tom freaking Nalen <laughs> is who this guy was supposed to be. And I have never seen a player. Now he's gotten much better and I think he's an average quality center now, but at the time I've never seen a man be picked up like a WWE wrestling thing by defensive tackles and launched into the quarterback. He was not physically ready to come play in the NFL. And they made this desperate draft pick because they just needed a center because Pat Elfline had gotten hurt and had fallen apart. But that's not the worst part of it. Irv Smith Jr. was billed as this hybrid wide receiver tight end. He's going to come in. He's going to do everything. The next draft pick off the board is A.J. Brown. And the Vikings needed a wide receiver. They had to know at that point that Diggs was was potentially problematic, right? So yeah, they had Diggs and Thielen, but they had to know. Everybody knew at that point that Diggs was probably not long for Minnesota, or at least was some major issues that were going on there. And that just doesn't even discount the cornerback issues that were to come, the defense that was coming apart because of old age. And they said, no, we need a number two tight end (laughs) because Kyle Rudolph is probably going to be gone within the next two seasons and drafting a center right away to fix your problem at center is a desperate flail that completely failed for them. And and, and non-premium positions, these are positions that you can draft in the third round and get usually the same caliber of player. That one was totally disastrous in my mind. Didn't the Saints actually take a center who's good in the same draft, like in the second or third round? Uh, yes. The 19 I th- draft? Yes. They- I forget. I, yeah, I forget who it was. There were, there were other linemen taken that were interior players that turned out. Okay. In that draft. Yes. Unless you have a pro bowl player, like Hamilton's a perfect example of, okay, he would have, you could have justified that pick easily, but like safeties. Yeah. I'm sorry. Unless I think the guy's going to Canton. Like if I don't have a Canton grade on, on you and you're a center or safety, you ain't a first round pick. Yeah. That was something else that got me. Um, what is the, what is the funniest pick for you guys where it was a late rounder and people got super pumped, super <laughs> easy for me all and you quarter- got, and you yeah, were like quarterbacks. Well, no, what the, uh, the German wide receiver that we found on YouTube. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, Moritz. <laughs> what was the German? Moritz, what was boring? Bo- Bo- what was uh, boring? Yeah. Yeah. I remember being at the Winter park when they drafted him. We're like, this can't be real. Right. Like, what are we doing here? And. <laughs> The German YouTube. Yeah, and then Spillman <laughs> kept reiterating that we saw clips of him on YouTube and we liked what we saw on YouTube. Like, that's it? Like, <laughs> yeah, that one. I that liked, was a one-day um, story. My my favorite, and I say this only because he was okay, is Jalen Twyman, who people build as Aaron Donald. <laughs> and then he, because he went to Pitt and had a bunch of sacks <laughs> and he was a fire hydrant or whatever. And then... And again, I'm, I'm not, he's fine. Then he got shot in the off season and he just like never play. And it was just like, what is going on? I mean, this was, this was a pick what year that was fans that? were going completely crazy over. Uh, that was, I believe 20, 2021. Yeah. I was gonna say 20, 2021. Yeah. It was not long yeah. ago. Yeah. 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 That. And again, I only, I'm not being yeah. inappropriate. I, no. it's, it's terrible that what happened to him, but it was one of those picks where you just could not believe that everyone got as hyped as they were over. The, he would have been a first round pick if he was taking a different year. Like what? And then, you know, he ends up just never even stepping foot on the, the field. other one for me was uh, Joe Webb jumping over the bags. Remember the, the pre the oh, combine yeah. thing, he, they, they stacked up the bags and he jumped. So you knew he had like this incredible athlete, you, like had no idea like what position he was going to be good at, but. Fans went nuts over Joe Webb because he was super athletic. And when he jumped over those pads, we're like, we've never seen this before. Yeah. <laughs> All quarterbacks, right? Yeah. Like, Any quarterback, like yeah. John David Booty in the fifth round. Can't believe we got him. It's so funny yeah. because it's it, – and I, I mean, this is – to this day, you take a quarterback on day three yeah, he's, and fans – and fans are still like, okay, I mean, they this might be their guy. I mean, it's literally flyers. And, yes, 
Brock Purdy and Brady happened, yeah. but they're extremely, extremely rare. You know, Jalen Hall, uh, who knows? He could, <laughs> and then the poor kid is like, no, 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 no. So I, I just love, I love QBs because you can take them in rounds one through seven, and there's going to be a certain amount of hype regardless of what round it's in. You know, I mean, the rest of the day three picture, I was like, okay, yeah. guy might be who knows, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Quarterbacks, it's like, I wonder if JDB can I've seen him in college. I've seen all his games. <laughs> Oh, the uh, well, now we have the extra layer of tweeting out their highlights, That's which right, hypes yeah. people. Out. Look at this throw. The yeah. Vikings got a steal. <laughs> no, they didn't. Um, mine also for the late rounder was when they drafted the long snapper, Austin Cutting. <laughs> and right, yeah. he was getting a pardon or something to be able to play <laughs> from the president or whatever. And uh, at some point, at some point, and Courtney and I once went looked back for this quote and we found it. Zimmer said something to the extent of he shouldn't be shaky as a long snapper because he's been trained for war. <laughs> and he what he wasn't Mike. trained for war, by the way. That wasn't what he was doing with the military. Like, Mike, every single person in the military is not like if you have killed man, you can snap the ball. He's been in the theater of war. He can go to Green Bay. You can shoot right. If you can storm the beach of Normandy, you can snap a ball. Mike. Come on, Mike. Mike oh, didn't man. even mean it at times. And the stuff was funny. Oh, yeah. He's just they've trained him for oh, war. Oh gosh. Uh anyway, uh, so last last thing, quick prediction. Uh, what happens on draft night, Chip and then Judd? They're taking a quarterback, they're moving up. If they can get to three, they'll take Dre May. If they can get to four, they're gonna take JJ McCarthy. All right. What do you think, Judd? I think that's probably accurate. I, I do. Here's the one question, though, and we don't know this for sure, is what's the appetite and is it universal in the building to trade your 2025 first? Because I don't think you're getting a three without nope. it. I have serious I have serious doubts about four because there's going to be competition. Denver wants to go up from 12. I think the Giants might go from six to like three or four. Raiders. Like da da the Daniel, yeah, uh, that's a good one. The Daniel Jones contract to me, it would hurt to swallow and 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 let him go after the season, but it can be done. So I think if you, if you put me on the spot, I would say they're going to trade up. They're going to take probably McCarthy, and I would say it's going to be five to the Chargers. I, I like these predictions. I I think you can get out of trading your 2025 first, possibly in a trade with the Chargers. I like these predictions. I think they're good. I am going to try, just, just try my hand here at going a slightly different route, which is the stick and pick, but McCarthy drops to 11. That the, the hype mm. on McCarthy is more than we think, but he's still a first round caliber prospect. And he just, and they... Don't trade out. Arizona takes a receiver. The Chargers take a receiver. The Giants draft Dallas Turner or, or Joe Alts to rebuild their offensive line. And they're going to wait a year and maybe picture Dur Sanders next year. And then you end up with Tennessee. Uh, Atlanta needs a defensive player and nobody wants to make this trade up for McCarthy. And they end up picking him there. And then Bo Nix or somebody goes off the board to uh, the Broncos and we go from there. That's, that's, that's like my, my hot prediction that I'm trying to, to work through uh, before we get to draft night. Do you think Denver or the Raiders jump the Vikings though? That's, that's the hard part, right? That's, that's the hard like, part. Yeah. That's why I don't think Sean Payton's going to, I don't either. I don't think you can play defense. I think you have to play offense on this one. It, Cause if you wait, you may be left holding an empty bag. I'm trying it. I'm test casing it. Right <laughs> okay. Now. We've got some time before the draft. I'm test casing this take that McCarthy is well, not. It's be, ideal. Uh, It'd be perfect. Required yeah. to trade up. Yeah. I mean, yep. cause you're keeping 23 yeah. though. So like, yes, exactly. It's it, it, if you're a, if you're a Vikings fan, it's awesome. I just don't, I don't trust teams not to jump. I don't either. If that, if that scenario happened, Quasi and O'Connell will float out of that draft room because that will be their dream scenario. Yes. I just, I don't, there'd be so much champagne. I, consumed. Could you imagine how much they would be sweating, waiting from four to 11 oh. that somebody's going to come up and do it? <laughs> 
Well, I think that uh, they have to be comfortable with multiple ways that this could yeah. play out. So uh, yeah. plenty of time to work through all the scenarios for us. But this, guys, I, I can't tell you how much of a treat this is for me to hear the uh, the draft stories uh, from back in your early years, working the beat together as Access Vikings with Scoggins and uh, Zolgad. So thank you both so much for taking the time and doing this. This was really fun. It was everything I dreamed it would be. So thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Matthew. Appreciate it, man. Awesome. Football.